ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Square Time Cross Talk. It's 10 to 11 this morning, and in our studio today, we are honored to have next to my right, Mr. Uh, Bradley J. Gordon. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. And on his right, that Mr. Steele Humbert. Yes. These two, the pair of lawyers, they are the pair of lawyers responsible for representing and helping Cambodia in bringing back the lost ancient artifacts from all over the world back to Cambodia, including, if you read our paper, the 77 pre ungorian and Ungarian artifacts and jewelries from the large part family in UK. So, sir, please, the first question, I want to start with uh, Mr. Gordon. Can you please tell our audience about yourself? A little bit, yes. So I'm from the United States. I grew up in Connecticut. And um, I went to Brown University and then <coughs> Harvard Law School. And um, I spent about 10 years as an international lawyer in large law firms. And I came to Cambodia about 16 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. I did spend about 30 years ago, I spent time in a Cambodian refugee camp, yes. working with Cambodians and teaching, teaching English. Which, which camp, can you please? Uh, I was in the Panatnikom refugee camp in yes. Chonburi, yes. Thailand. Yes, thank you, sir. Mr. Steinberg, how about you? Can you tell us about yourself? Certainly. I'm a physician and an attorney, and I practice in the United States. Wait, wait, wait. You are a doctor and a lawyer? I am. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> and I, I'm from the United States. I practice in California, where I have a uh, but I've been coming to Cambodia now for about 20 years. I first came here as a visit, and I ended up getting involved in starting free schools in many of the slums around Phnom Penh. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that I will guest today. So I want to start with Gordon again, please. Uh, um, I heard that you started all this, you know, representing Cambodia, bringing back artifacts, lost artifacts, stolen artifacts, thousands, hundreds of them back to Cambodia. Can you please tell us about how this start? How did it start? So I would say, first of all, that I'm in the footsteps of many others who started, uh, started this work um, yeah. to get back um, national treasures of Cambodia. My personal involvement was about 12, 13 years ago. Um, I was in touch with the Department of Justice, and they asked our team to go around the countryside and to look at the smuggling network. And at the time, we were only focused on one statue. It was the Doriodana statue, which is now at the National Museum. Mm -hmm. um, so our team went out, and we managed to find the head of the looting gang. Oh, um, wow. And over many years, we became very close to him. And he decided to help Cambodia. He decided to um, share all the information he could with us to, um, to get back the national treasures. And then in um, probably about seven years ago, I asked Steve to join our team. Steve has a very unique set of skills. He's a trial lawyer. Um, yep. He's been exceptionally help helpful to us in terms of um, strategy and, and just dealing with, with difficult situations. It's not been easy overall. Um, so Steve has come in. We're officially, um, about six, six years ago, we were officially appointed by um, the Ministry of Culture. Yep. So Everything we do is under the tremendous leadership of Minister Sakona mm -hmm. from the Ministry of Culture. We also have had enormous support from many se senior people in the government. Mm -hmm. So I feel, you know, fortunate that we're here to represent the team. Mm -hmm. Where you know this is not a, a, a one-person effort. This has taken many, many people mm -hmm. to bring back your national treasures. Yes, and uh, Mr. Stimba, I. I just heard it. You are a lawyer and a doctor, but you, s you decided to spend your time here in Cambodia helping the country, helping the kingdom, bringing back the, 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 the lost and stolen artifacts. Why did, why did, you, why did you do this? What <coughs> what the reason behind it? Well, after spending some time here with the schools, I fell in love with Cambodia and the Cambodian people. I, it's really that simple. And then I was fortunate enough to be invited by Brad to join what he, the fantastic team he had assembled, and all of the, minis the, the ministers and the, the royal government here, the great the, the great start of what it was already going on. And it was just my honor to become a part of it. Thank you very much. So, Gordon, um, if, if you don't mind, do you, do you know so far how many cases have you worked on and how many artifacts so far have you returned to Cambodia? <coughs> do you remember? You had the number? Look, we, we think that um, there could be up to 4,000 or so statues taken out 
illegally from yeah. Cambodia, maybe more. Um, you know, in the last couple of years, I think we're responsible as a team for bringing back um, hundreds Absolutely. of statues. Yeah, it's you know, in the next within the next six months or so, I think you would see at least three hundred objects wow. have been returned. Um, so it's 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 a whole wing, at least a whole wing of yeah. the National Museum <laughs> yes. that we have helped to bring home. Yes, and how many countries have you covered so far? Uh, to bring back the, the statue, you the know, jewelry. I think we're active in about 10, 10 countries right now. 10 um, but mostly the United States and UK, and we've opened up discussions in France also. So, in your case, in your cases, so how did these artifacts leave Cambodia and ended up in other countries? You see, how did how how did it happen? I, you know, I, I it's been a very um, sad tale for us to learn about that um, during time of war and genocide that um, certain individuals um, took advantage of the situation. Um, many of the Cambodians who were involved were just trying to survive. You know, they, they were just trying to make um, a small amount of money. Um, but there were people outside who made a huge amount of money and they were buying and selling the statues. So, it, you know, I think if there had not been war, um, maybe we would not have seen so much. I'm, I'm sure we wouldn't have seen so much looting. It really got out of, I mean, it was massive, you know, back early 70s, 80s, 90s, you know. Now at a time of peace, I think the numbers have gone way down. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Stimba, I mean, you have been, I think six or seven years you have working on this, this task of bringing back artifacts to Cambodia. You started it because you love Cambodia, you love the Cambodian people. But how, how I mean, how 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 you feel? I mean, working on this for a few years. How, uh, just can you please tell me about your personal feeling? You know, working on this. Sure, uh, it's it's a feeling of honor and privilege, as. Uh, Brad mentioned the statues were taken, the artifacts were taken from here, and then they went to, not surprisingly, all the places in the world where the money is. So <clears throat> we have had to do deep investigations and uh, apply as much pressure as possible uh, and in sort of a, you know, with, without all the resources, without all the money working uphill, it's really an honor and a privilege to have tried to do this and to try to, ne we, to have already negotiated back several collections and many more along the way. Yes. So, it is a, it's just a question, of, just out of curiosity. Um, how did you trace this this artifact, how you, you see, how, how do you do it? Did you find the artifact in the other country, like thousands of miles away from Cambodia? How do you, you see, how do you do it? So there's, there's been a number of steps. Um, you know, we have the former looters. Uh, many of them are Khmer Rouge child soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, they have been giving us detailed information. They remember, they remember where they took something out. They remember the size, they remember the location, they remember who was with them. So we've collected all that information. And then we've also created a database. We've created a database of all the pieces we know of in museums around the world. Um, we have about 2,000 objects already in that database from the museums, and then we're putting in things from the private collections. So I think the other key thing has been emails. We received a huge amount of emails from one family. They agreed to give, they, they, they were the daughter of one of the, one of the largest dealers in stolen antiquities, agreed to give all her emails, all, all her father's emails. So we've been going through that. In the emails, there's all kinds of evidence and information about where statues ended up. So those, those types of, um, that type of data has helped us enormously. And then we're working with the US government, we're working with the UK government. You know, they have their own ways of investigating yeah. and so you know we're just part of the story there are people there are prosecutors in new york there are homeland security agents there's many people who have been looking into what happened and it's it's i i believe it's the largest art crime in history so this has this is going to take a while to figure out and it's 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 multiple crime sites it's yes. many many crime sites and this is really part of the excitement and thrill of what we're what we're privileged to be doing cuz the more you learn the more contacts we have the more 
sources are open, the more people that are talking to us, the more we learn from them, the more we can share. And it's just what was once a small trickle of information is becoming a flood. And we hope that that's going to be true in the very near future as to the sta statues and artifacts we're bringing back. I would, I, I also just want to add that, you know, we have 30, 40 people working on this. And we have many, many Cambodians. And we have archaeologists also from the Ministry of Culture working with us, looking at photographs and saying, hey, we think this is from this temple. We think this is from this period. So it's really taken multiple skills and many different people to come together to figure this out. Yeah. So most of the artifacts that, that uh, uh, both of you have, uh, have, have brought home to Cambodia, most of them, are they in personal collection or in the museums? Um, many of those have been in private collections. Private the, collections. Some, there's a couple coming back from a prominent museum in Colorado. Um, there's one arriving maybe next week. Um, so there's a handful that are coming back from museums. But right now, most, most of them are private collections. Yes. And, uh, we have a goal now that is, uh, and we're working very diligently with the team towards getting, prying uh, the, things loose from the other st uh, other major museums. There are many museums around the world that are still in possession of many Cambodian artifacts. Mm -hmm. wow. and, you know, we have priorities. I would say the Metropolitan Museum in New York has the largest, one of the largest collections in the world. Yeah. And we know that many of those statues um, trace back to illegal looting yeah. here in Cambodia. Is it, is it uh, legally, is it, uh, I'm sure it's probably a complicated process, you know, of bringing those back to Cambodia. I mean, do you have any challenges, problem with, with, with the process, with the procedure? Is it, is it like really a headache? Look, I, I, you know, we, we have a lot of assistance, a lot of people helping, right? Yes. But it's still not easy um, for us. There's all kinds of issues with, you know, some of these museums, some of these collectors have their own lawyers, and their position is, no, we need to prove to them it's stolen. We need to prove yeah. where it came from exactly. When you're talking thousands of statues, it's not so easy to do for each statue to go back in time, 30, 40, 50 years, and say, OK, it came from this, this place. So you know, sometimes the lawyers on the other side, the museums and stuff, they're, they're being very difficult. Other museums, I say the majority, are neutral or they're being very helpful. And the ones being very helpful, there's an, a, a number of them, more and more. And they're saying, look, we don't want to have stolen antiquities in our mm, collection. Yeah. Come see us. We'll show you what we have, and we'll show you all the provenance documents and so on. So like museums like Victoria and Albert in, in London, amazing. They, they showed us everything. They showed us what was in storage. They were very open. They said, if there's anything you want, make a request, we will go to our board. Oh, wow. And, wow. and when Brad talks about Providence, that's, that's in the art world, that's the equivalent of getting good title, a good chain of title on your home. And many of the less helpful museums, the one trying to hold on to all their pieces, have taken the position saying, you prove to us uh, with all the evidence that it's yours. And we have tried our best to turn the tables on this by saying, no, 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 you're living in our house. You show any legal title, any claim that you have that justifies your keeping it. Wow, okay, thank you very much for the very, very special answer. Um, so you talk about the museum here, but how about the private collection? I mean, of course, individual can have lawyer as well. And those yeah. who own, uh, the people who own those artifacts, they must not be poor. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so there is one, uh, one incredible case. One yeah. billionaire in America, yeah. he invited Architectural Digest into his home, mm -hmm. and he took photos. Okay. And in the magazine are the photographs with a, a lot of your Cambodian statues <laughs> and masterpieces like uh, national treasures of incredible importance to Cambodia. Yeah. We're sitting in the living room of a billionaire in Florida. So somebody who wasn't very happy with Latchford sent me the photographs. Yeah. And they said, hey, look at this. And so we started looking. And then, I don't know if you saw the Washington Post did a whole investigation to ICIJ in Washington Post. And they found that, they found that some, some of the photos later in Architectural Magazine, they had, they had taken out they had uh, wiped, taken, erased the Cambodian statues. <laughs> <laughs> so this is incredible. This billionaire family, uh, their name is the Lindemans. They need to give this back. These are extremely important statues for Cambodia. They're from Kokke. 
They yeah. need to come home. And then there's the other extreme. We have met certain billionaires in private collections who say, I didn't know and <clears throat> that these were stolen. I didn't understand. But now that I understand the history, they belong to Cambodia and I want to give them back. Oh, wow. So there's the whole gamut of, of private collectors, just like there is of the museums, from honorable to less honorable. Thank you. And I, I think one, you know, one amazing thing right now is because of all the media and all the, the interest from Cambodians and the international community, a number of private collectors are contacting us and they're saying, we want to give this back. Wow, that's special, yeah. that's special. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I really, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, but uh, the recent case, the the most return to Cambodia, the the collection from from the uh, from the large Ford family in UK. I'm yeah. really, I'm really curious about this. Can you tell us more about the, how did it start and the end, of course? Uh, so, about um, 2017, 2016, I I spoke to um, His Excellency um, Wood and I said to um, Sukpudiwood. Look, there's a guy out there. He's got this extraordinary collection. Um, we think that we can we can maybe bring it home, and we don't need to go to court. We can go talk to the family. And um, His Excellency Sokputiwood believed in us, and he said, "Okay, let's go see the Minister of Culture." We went to see Minister Sakona, and she said, "Okay, let's go for it." So we 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 started having discussions with the Latchford family for three years in secret. No one knew. A very small number of people knew. We, we, our team, our team kept it secret. Amazing for three years, and we were talking and talking. Finally, um, a couple of things happened. Douglas Latchford was indicted by the U.S. government, government um, in t uh, 2019 for trafficking in illegal um, antiquities, yeah. and then 2020 he died. Shortly after he died, his daughter signed the agreement. The agreement is to return everything that, that she has that's Cambodian. And so we, we got the agreement signed, and then COVID was going on, so we yeah. had all kinds of delays <laughs> in terms of bringing it back. Yeah. But as you can see, you know, every month, every, you know, every year that goes by, we're starting to see more of that collection come home now. Mm -hmm. And we have asked her, at this point, we have said to her, please return everything. We want, we want everything shipped back to yeah. Cambodia. So last week, no, two weeks ago, we held about 70 pieces. There's still, yes. still more left. So that was, you know, for the 77 pieces, extraordinary, with um, His Excellency Hun Mani uh, leading us. We went, a delegation of nine people, eight Cam Cambodians and myself, flew to London in, in secretly <laughs> and picked up, you know, got the collection and we brought it home. How incredible. I felt like so privileged that we were a special uh, delegation sent on this secret mission to London to bring it home, and I think the world was shocked when they started seeing mm, the photos. Yeah, yeah. And you can see the news spread everywhere. Yes, yeah. And that gold collection, that, you know, many of those gold pieces, we believe, were worn by the kings and queens of Angkorian period yeah. and the pre-Angkorian period. And, you know, the craftsmanship, the meaning, the significance, this is worn by the royal family from, you know, centuries again, ago. It's home now. It yeah. came home. It, it's such a thrill when you see <clears throat> like this bejeweled armband, and you see one of the statues with with uh, with this armband carved in, and then you can put the real one next to it. Yeah. Wow. So we talk about the present, we talk about the past, and I want to ask you about the future. So you said there's still thousand thousand of yeah. pieces all over the world. So what what's next? Any plan for the future? We're very active. <laughs> There's a lot going on. So you're going to have a lot more news to report, a lot more returns. Yeah. Um, you know, we really thinking a lot and talking with the minister about um, creating new spaces here in Cambodia. You know, there's a debate. Do you put the statue back in the temple? It, it's, it's not a piece of art. It's, it's a spiritual, sacred um, object. And it's living. Yeah. You know, I, I was with the deputy director of the museum the other day, and he talked about it having a beating heart. You know, when Cambodians look at this, these are living beings. So one question is how to properly care for them when they come home, how to maybe build new museum spaces. So I think in the next uh, six to 12 months, you'll see uh, some announcements about plans. How are we going to take care of them? What's going to 
what's going to happen in the future. And then I can't wait until the day I can bring you to the National Museum and oh, yeah, show please. you all this. <laughs> because I think when you see it in person, it, it, it will move you so much. You, yes. you, you, you would be like, yeah. my ancestors made this. Yes. Anything to add, Simon? Well, <clears throat> I guess two things. One is that we are, as far as the actual retrieving of some of these pieces, we have ongoing negotiations and we're trying to apply greater pressure to the persons and the, the collectors privately and the museums and the art houses that are most resistant to returning them and we're, we're having good success with that. Uh, and to put further onto what Brad was saying about bringing them back and putting a new place for them. We're, uh, we and, and the ministry are starting to put together a foundation uh, where, uh, where th there will be an entity responsible for caring for these, for ongoing uh, new excavations. A lot of our investigations are, are showing up new targeted areas to dig with it, that show things. One of our great thrills though is this is starting to uncover more of Angkorian history and starting to show the glory of the past Angkorian Empire and putting together the pieces and we think that that's going to be a real piece of progress as this goes along. We certainly hope so and it's very exciting for, for uh, yeah. us all. Yeah, to add to that I would say that um, look in the beginning was a very secret negotiation. You were talking like yeah. six, seven people and you know some that prime minister knew what was going on, but we kept it all very, very quiet, right? Yeah. And now we're in a process of surveying. Where is everything? That's what we're at right now. But I think the most excitement is when all, <laughs> many of these come home, is what we're discovering in Cambodia. Yeah. I think when you know more about the excavations and the discoveries and, and the potential places, you're gonna be so excited because so much more of, of Cambodian history is gonna be known and the world is gonna be just watching every week <laughs> what did they find out yeah. you know what what is what and i think your you know your history is so rich and so deep and and i think um most of the world doesn't quite understand they know encore but they don't know the rest of the story so much yeah and i think a lot of this will start to come out and Gokke is going to become much more important pre Angkorian uh, cities around the country will start to be known. I think in the next five, ten years, I always say to people, it's going to not just be a story of retrieving statues, yeah. it's going to be a story of opening up the past and understanding better. I also think it's going to be a story of, <clears throat> in the same way that the King Tut uh, pieces went around the world in display, I think that that will happen to some, hopefully, large extent with Cambodians Tre with some of Cambodia's treasures, letting the world know just how incredible all of this was and helping put Cambodia back into its rightful spot among the world of nations. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is kind of a bit personal question. So many uh, hun hundreds of species have brought back to Cambodia. For you, uh, uh, Gordon, do you have any like favorite piece, the one that you feel like, you know, be the closest to it? I think the, there's there's two that came from the same temple yeah. in Gokke. It's the Skanda and Shiva, it's the father and son, mm -hmm. and then the Skanda and the peacock. Mm -hmm. Because I became very close friends with Lion, the, the gang leader, mm -hmm. and he told me where he found those. And we dug and we found the air and we found the arm. <laughs> oh, wow. So we know it came from that temple, and I feel like that you know, he, to he started telling me this story 10 years ago. I didn't understand the significance, and I didn't know where the temple was he was talking about. Finally, he took me there, and now to see the statues come home, I think, wow, what if we had just walked away six, seven years ago? What if we had just stopped, you know, what, what, and he died. He died la a year ago. Mm -hmm. So that, that, for me, to get his contribution, his memory, and to see those statues come home today, and I think you will... When you see those statues, you're going to love them, and they will be all over the press, all over everywhere. <laughs> wow. The, the gang leaders, has he ever, like, had he ever, like, uh, show any kind of remorse, regret for, for looting the temple? Yeah. He, you know, one day we were with him with the archaeologists, and he couldn't stop crying. He apologized to everyone mm -hmm. for what he had done. Okay. How about you, Stimberg? Uh, any favorite piece? I guess my other favorite would be the Ganesha, the Ganesha. that, that uh, 
partly because of what it symbolizes, but it, that we, that the whole team was very proud. This was on the list of the 10 most wanted to be retrieved art pieces that were missing in the entire planet. And managing to get that one back for Cambodia, I think, made us very proud. Thank you very much. I see our show is near the end. But last but not least, I want you to look at the camera mm -hmm. and say what you want to say to our audience, to people around the world. Uh, please, go ahead please, you first. So we would ask uh, anyone out there who knows the whereabouts of um, stolen Cambodian statues to contact us. And um, private collectors and museums, you know, I, I think if the Cambodians want these statues to come home, they need to be returned. You should respect that. They were taken out illegally. They were taken out, many of them, during a time of war and genocide. They need to come back. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Stinberg, please. I would like to thank Samdek, and I would like to thank the ministries for helping and supporting us and giving us the honor and the privilege to be involved with our entire team and uh, in pursuing this uh, uh, these goals and for our opportunity to work with one of the things we didn't get a chance to mention is how wonderful all of our experiences with all the Cambodian people with whom we've come in contact and uh, it really is a privilege thank you very much for letting us be part of it thank you very much sir I mean on behalf of a newspaper in Cambodia, on behalf of all Cambodian people, I would like to thank you for your effort. Okay. Yeah. For your effort okay. in helping Cambodia bring back the lost artifact, the lost treasure. Some were lost, some were stolen from Cambodia to bring back home. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's all for our session.